Poiso, um, Fault to welcome uh, to this the fifth uh, uh, seminar in our series um, of Pererin Oiv. Um, uh, I know that some some of you here will have been to some of the sessions already, but there are people here tonight who haven't been before. So I'm just going to do like a brief introduction to the project before introducing um, Catherine. Um, so uh, my name is Rowan O'Neill. It's Misha Rowan Nail, but anyway, Rowan. Um, I'm working with Span Art in Pembrokeshire um, and colleagues Jacob Whittaker and Alan Wills, who are here tonight, <coughs> and also colleagues in Wexford. Um, and uh, we're working on this project that is being uh, is part of the Ancient Connections project, um, which is uh, creating a new pilgrimage route between St David's in Pembrokeshire and Ferns in Wexford. And um, our project is... Um, uh, trying to um, well, sort of connect with the, the Welsh and Irish diaspora, but we're also trying to answer this question, uh, am I a pilgrim? And uh, our, our way of doing this so far has been uh, sort of inspired by a Welsh hymn, an 18th century Welsh hymn uh, called Pererin Oiv, which is where the title of our project comes from. Pererin Oiv is Oilithriach May. Uh, literally translates as I am a pilgrim. Um, and so uh, part of our project, we have been inviting people to uh, sing this hymn uh, or uh, any song that uh, calls you back home uh, and to pin that song to an online map. Um, so that has been part of the project activity, but also We've been holding this uh, series of seminars with different speakers with um, expertise uh, relating to the themes of the project around um, identity, uh, song, home and pilgrimage. Um, and so tonight, uh, before I introduce Catherine, who will be our fifth speaker in this series, um, I was just going to show a little film that I made uh, some time ago. Uh, I actually made it for my dad's 60th birthday, um, but I'm going to show it because I feel that it does speak to um, some of the, well, what I'm sort of calling the complexities, paradoxes and invisibilities of diaspora identity. And it, it's, it sort of it is what um, some of what Catherine will be speaking about um, tonight. So I'm just going to uh, share my screen and show the film. My father will be 60 next week. Happy birthday, Dad. Here's what you mean to me. Timothy John on his om bom bom. Born in the sound of the bow bells, doing the Lambeth walk, you swept the streets for the craze, or so you said, from outside Guinness buildings. I followed you, tried to find my way back home, your home, to the oval gasworks that your dad painted, via the Elephant and Castle, all the way from Galway to Carlo to Jersey. Is that what brought you mother's way? the great big jersey-lashed eyes and the separated cream. James Goldfoot II, you're a dairy farmer now. Milking the morning, milking the night, and every summer our annual holiday to your Fenland home, to the memory of the four winds where we drink milk out of silver top bottles and synthetic cream squirted from a can. From this Cromwellian stronghold, we visit the Bridge of Sighs and the Scott Polar Museum. World travellers and world explorers from the urban comfort of your old home. Later, you'll bring me here again when we come for my interview and the West East trip will begin again, six times a year for three years to come. And you'll sit apart from me in the Pickerel Inn, nursing your pint whilst I try to find my way in a new crowd that's a long, long way from home. 
It's taken me some time to understand what all the uprooting and transplanting was for. And now you're 60, and I am fully grown. That west-east line of latitude marks my gratitude for all that I have known. So here's to you and your family. You really should be proud. Roin valcho honoti. Uh, I'm going to introduce Catherine now um, and I've stopped sharing my screen haven't I so uh, yeah um, so uh, welcome to Catherine Catherine Dunn is the author of 11 published novels and one work of non-fiction and unconsidered people exploring the lives of Irish immigrants in 1950s London her novels include the things we know now um, recipient of the Giovanni Boccaccio International Prize for Fiction in 2013 and shortlisted for the Novel of the Year at the Irish Book Awards. The, the years that followed, long listed for the International Dublin Literary Award in 2018 and Concada la Lucia, The Way the Light Falls, shortlisted for the U European Strega Prize for Fiction in 2019. Catherine received the Irish Pen Award for Outstanding Contribution to Irish Literature in 2018 and in January 2021, she was decorated as Cavalier of the Order Stella d'Italia. And also in 2021, her book, um, the, uh, An Unconsidered People, uh, Exploring the Lives of Irish Immigrants in 1950s London, was republished in October 2021. Um, and with a, an introduction by Dermot Ferreter, who uh, writes, um, Catherine is attuned to the emotional and psychological impacts of emigration and a history associated with it that is knotty, multi-layered and contradictory, encompassing guilt, shame, mobility, progress, dislocation, tragedy, separation and adjustment. And um, yes, my film would have kind of made sense of it <laughs> as well. But um, welcome, Catherine. Really looking forward to, to, to your um, speaking tonight. And um, I will hand over to you. Thank you very much, Rowan. Um, and good evening, everybody. And thank you for turning up to this session in the project I Am a Pilgrim. And tonight's talk we have entitled Uprooting and Transplanting looking at the experience of the Irish in 1950s Britain. Um, I've always been fascinated by the notion of pilgrimage, why we might undertake a pilgrimage and how they might change us. And while this project's focus has been the Welsh and Irish diasporas of North Pembrokeshire and North Wexford, today we're going to range a little further and explore the lives of those Irish emigrants who left from every county in Ireland in search of a better life in post-war Britain. So let me just give you a quick outline of what I hope to cover tonight. And of course, this is only skating on the surface. We will have time for a Q&A at the end. But if somebody really desperately wants to ask a question at some stage during the talk, Rowan has very kindly offered to monitor the chat. And please feel free to interrupt me at any stage. The more dialogue we have, the better. So I'm going to begin by looking at the old notion of pilgrimage and then moving on from that to what it meant for people to have a visceral separation from home and embark, if you like, on some kind of an unwilling pilgrimage in search of something better. So that, that's the uprooting part of the, of, the, of the session. The transplanting then will look at how those people tried to make a lies for themselves in what felt like a very hostile environment, and to look at the role of the Catholic Church in helping them or hindering them from making that new place. Look at the role of pubs, alcoholism, the role of work, and then a particular focus on the experience of women who were outliers in the terms of European migration, uh, in the sense that they, might, they emigrated from Ireland alone they emigrated without husbands, fathers, brothers, family members, which was most unusual in the European pattern of migration. And then we'll have a look at the whole notion of coming home, what it's like to come back to somewhere that you've left for several decades. 
and then we'll have the Q&A at the end. And then, as Rowan said, I will from time to time be giving you a writing prompt um, to spark people who might be interested in doing some kind of reflective or creative writing around this issue. I will never put anybody on the spot. If you'd like to share what you've written, what we'll do is take maybe two minutes, two or three minutes of silence. And then if anybody wants to share it, we can share for another couple of minutes. If not, if you'd like to keep it private and email it to me afterwards for a comment, we can certainly do that too. So there are, of course, many, many Irish success stories in Britain. This focus tonight, though, is not on the what we would call the success stories. This is on what I have termed unconsidered people. They were not forgotten. They were never forgotten by their families or their communities, those who left in the 50s. But they were unconsidered, and that's quite a significant difference. Uh, Joe Lee, for example, the historian, wrote that in no other country was emigration such a necessary pre prerequisite for the maintenance of social order. That if the half million people who left these shores in the 1950s hadn't left, there would have been a great deal of social unrest because of very, very poor economic conditions, unemployment, and a fairly suffocating society. So to look at the notion of pilgrimage, I go back as might be fitting on Thanksgiving to look at the experience of the pilgrims in 1620. And William Bradford, who was the head of the separatist group that left Britain to make their lives in America, left seeking religious freedom because they felt that they could not endure the yoke of the Anglican Church in Britain, that they needed a great deal more freedom to practice their brand of spiritual life. And that's often a theme in the pilgrimage. It's to leave something in search of something better. Now, unfortunately for this original group of um, pilgrims, 50%, 100 of them left and 50, 50 of them died in the very early days of their arrival on that new shore. And their deaths were caused by harsh weather, hostile natives, uh, bad conditions, but they persevered. And this is also something that is common to the pilgrim, that notion of perseverance. Which brings me on then to something which we had to read at university uh, called John Bunyan's The Pilgrim's Progress. And that was published in 1678. And it embraces that similar notion of suffering and enduring hardships, but always with the eye on the reward to eternal life. And poor Christian finds himself in the slough of despond from which he has to struggle to escape and always struggling towards the light. So that notion of seeking something higher, some kind of greater good, some important illumination, about what it is to be human has always been stitched into the notion of pilgrimage. Even modern pilgrimages, such as the Camino de Santiago in Spain, are a process of searching or attempting to assuage something. The pilgrim is looking to find his or her place at the end of this searching and is, according to Pamela Petro, who had a beautiful phrase in the previous session of this project, she says, finding that place for the pilgrim is like walking into the soul's geography. However, for my unwilling or unhappy or optionless pilgrims from 1950s Ireland, the reality was something that was very different. There is a very beautiful novel, uh, which is haunting, written by Timothy O'Grady and Steve Pike, and it's called I Could Read the Sky. And in this novel, he puts words into the mouths of a nameless Irish emigrant who looks back on his life in what has always been for him a fairly hostile territory. So I'll just read you a short extract from this beautiful novel. In Timothy O'Grady and Steve Pike, Haunt Pike's haunting work, I Could Read the Sky, a nameless Irish immigrant lists to himself all the things he's capable of doing. It is an act of defiant self-definition, a way of carving out a psychic space for himself in a hostile and utterly foreign city. 
he reassures himself that he is still vital, alive and worthy of dignified acknowledgement. And the, the, the authors put the words into his mouth. He says, I could mend nets, patch a roof, build stairs, make a basket from reeds, splint the leg of a cow, cut turf, build a wall. What he could not do, however, even after many years of London life, was to remember the roots of buses, wear a collar in comfort, acknowledge the Queen, follow cricket, understand their jokes, kill a Sunday, stop remembering. So the, the, the experience of hostility and dislocation wasn't universal, but it was certainly widespread enough to be one of the most salient characteristics of particularly young men who left, Ireland, who left rural Ireland for the cities of Britain. Women tended to fare a little bit better, and we'll come back to that a little bit later on for those reasons. Now, Rowan has already mentioned um, Dermot Ferreter, who very kindly wrote the foreword to the reissue of An Unconsidered People. And Dermot Ferreter is a professor of modern Irish history at University College Dublin. And in the foreword, he says, the dislocation caused considerable pain. In the words of Irish writer and 1950s emigrant Donald Foley, many who left Ireland that decade had to cling to the comradeship of adversity. But many others did well. The hierarchy of the London Irish always created conflict and frustration, partly because the Irish were just as capable of exploiting and ill-treating their fellow natives as the English, and partly because of the belief that the term paddies was a liability. These fault lines were brought out strongly in Jimmy Murphy's raw play, The Kings of the Kilburn High Road, published in 2000. In 1956, he goes on, Ireland's Commission on Emigration, which had convened in 1948, stated that emigration had become a part of the generally accepted pattern of life. That did not make it any easier. Consider, for example, John Healy's book, Death of an Irish Town, 1968, in which he wrote of the emigrant train leaving Mayo in the 1950s. And I quote, the guard's door slamming shut was the breaking point. Like the first clatter of stones and sand on a coffin, it signals the finality of the old life. The young girls clutched and clung and wept in a frenzy. The Commission's report also suggested that emigration weakened national confidence and pride, but was also a conservative influence, as the scale of the exodus diluted the need for drastic action. In providing the remaining population with a reasonably satisfying standard of living, emigration, the report argued, made people apathetic about domestic underdevelopment. It is estimated that Irish emigrants in Britain sent the contemporary equivalent of 5.7 billion euro back to Irish families between 1940 and 1970. So we will look at some statistics later to see the impact that those emigrant remittances might have had. But for now, I want us to focus on what that kind of uprooting meant, what leaving home might have done to the psyche, described so brilliantly there by Dermot Healy. So two of the people I'd like to, to quote you from are two of my interviewees. One of them is Stephen, who talks about the uprooting from Ross Common. And this was a man who gave me the phrase with which he wanted his chapter titled, and it's called, Tis Savage Love, This Native Shore. He was a man incredibly wedded to the landscape of his native Ross Common. And the last thing he wanted to do was to leave. And here's how he describes it. 
there was no work in Roscommon in the late 1930s. As a result, there were all these skilled people queuing up to go to England for the construction. It was that or starvation. There was nothing to be got here, but they were getting at the labour exchange would buy nothing. All work on the building had stopped and the only work to be had was on the land. That was a different sort of paid job altogether. You wouldn't get the likes of 30 bob from working on the land. I remember a man called Cuddy from Athleague who owned a racing stables. Cuddy arrived at the Labour Exchange in Roscommon and started to sign up men for Wimpy and McAlpine in England. He put a tag here on the coat, same as you tie a parcel, and up to the railway station with them. This fellow could be for Rexby, so many fellows for London, and so on. The name of the builder and the fellow's destination was on the tag. There was hundreds went out of this town like that, hundreds. As a matter of fact, I was talking to a man the other night and he painted for Wimpy. He's 80 now. Cuddy became a millionaire out of the commissions he got for supplying labour. That's how he bought his racing stables up in the Curra. He was the first man in the Curra to put in those swimming baths for the horses. So although he mentions Cuddy being 80, remember that the first edition of these interviews was published 20 years ago, so I'm sure Cuddy is no longer with us. But Cuddy and his like made fortunes out of literally sending men from home like parcels to work on the building sites um, in post-war reconstruction Britain. And the final one, just on the topic of uprooting from home, is from a woman called Phyllis Izzard, who thankfully is still with us and still a close friend of mine, now in her 80s. She was the woman I met in 1986 on a boat from the former Yugoslavia to Venice, where her Irish accent to me was instantly recognisable and mine to her. And we got talking and it was learning about her experiences First of all, of having left Ireland as a very young girl to make her fortune in England because there was nothing for her here, but also that she had this mythological sense of the Ireland that she had left behind, which bore no relation to the Ireland that I was living through in the 1980s, which was in the midst of a dreadful recession. So I found those, those contrasts incredibly interesting. And it was Phyllis who actually sparked the idea for this book. So I asked her a direct question when I was interviewing her. I said to her, what is home or where is home for you? She says, I find it a strange phenomenon that when I'm here in England, I talk about going home to Ireland. And when I'm at home in Ireland, I talk about coming back here as going home. I must admit there is a sense for me of not belonging totally in either place. Even though we have made a home here, home is where we were born and where our heart is. Our hearts have never left there. I very often have the feeling of being neither one thing nor the other. I think too that the longer you stay here, the more difficult it is to make the break and go back to Ireland. That point in your life where it is possible suddenly passes. The problems begin once you've had your children and the children go to school. They start to make their friends and you'd be loath to do anything that would change their lives or to expect them to make changes for you. Because at the end of the day, that's what you'd be doing. You'd be fulfilling your wishes, but regarding theirs, if you decided to just up sticks and go back to Ireland. And then there's a strange situation when they've flown the coop and you think, I can do it now. I can go back home to Ireland. Before you know where you are, you've got grandchildren and you're pulled right back in again. You reach a point where you have to think, is it practical for one thing? And do I really want now, at this stage of my life, to start all over again? I'm not sure either of how accepted one would be. I could feel just as isolated at home now as I did when I first came to London as a youngster. The welcome is lovely when you go home, 
and everything on holiday is wonderful. But the reality of living there could be something entirely different. And it, it was Phyllis who gave me that lovely phrase of heart home and maid home. So she accepted that the two homes existed, but that they were very different in tenor one from the other, and that there's a huge ambivalence about where the real home is. And this is how Phyllis decided to describe it to herself. They were both real. One was of the heart, one was that she created. So at this point, I'd like to give you your first writing prompt. And again, we'll pause maybe just for two or three minutes. And if you wish to share, that's fine. And if not, you can send them by email or you can keep them completely private, whatever you wish. Here's what I want you to think about. You have just arrived in a strange new place. You step off the train. Look around you. Don't forget to look up. What do you see? List the words to fix the scene in your mind. Colours, shapes, thoughts, feelings. So an arrival out of the blue to a strange new place. You look around, you observe. What do you see with your eyes? What do you feel? What do you think? I'll give you three minutes starting now. OK. We can stop it there. So is there anybody who would like to share? Now, I won't be able to see hands, I think. Uh, I've got some tiny, tiny pictures in front of me, but maybe Rowan will help me with this. If there's anybody who would like to share, please just put up your hand. Paul, go, yeah, go ahead, Paul. Um, I've just written down words, actually, from um, when I left home for the first time, uh, uh, my home in South Wales, to go to university in North Wales in Bangor. And the words I've written down are Bangor, Sunday, rain, temperance, language. And they're all images that are it's ingrained in my mind because the first thing you see when you well, i assume now it's still there when you leave the train station in bangor in north wales is the temperance hotel at the time um uh Gwynedd, bangor was dry on the sunday they said so the pubs weren't open that was neither here nor there but the rain um and then being hit when i got to my hall of residence by the language that I thought I was fairly fluent in in South Wales was completely foreign to me in North Wales. And it's an image that sticks with me. And how long ago was that, Paul? Oh, gosh. Uh, it, it was 1975, so that's 47 years ago. So it's, it's extraordinary then the power that that memory still has, that you can still encapsulate it in those few words. I mean, that sounds to me like something you could really expand into a lovely memory if you were prepared to to write it in more detail. I well, think it, particularly that sense of, you know, moving from the things that were familiar to you to so, that sudden sense of dislocation to the language that you thought you, you knew and then suddenly realising that you didn't. Yeah, and suddenly being in that position that your, your mother and your father, but your mother really, mm -hmm. was seven hours away. Um, it's, yeah. Um, yeah. A big dislocation. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for sharing that. Anybody else? Rosemary, I think, has her hand up. Okay. Yes, it's um, Rosemary. Heart of flutter, disbelief, dark sky, atmosphere, smelly, an ominous presence, fouled pavements, park gates barring the way ahead, prison, no trees. No spaces between the towering buildings. Language alien. Tears, where are my hills? At the age of 14, moved from Shropshire to a very rural, a very rural setting, to South Manchester. And it was totally, totally alien. And I was so excited and it was just a horrible shock. And, and what a beautiful phrase, where are my hills? 
That could, that could be a title for a piece. Would you expand that piece? Have you written about that before in any detail? No, I haven't written about it in any detail, but we lived on the side of the Long Wind. And um, as children, we just used to wander off all day. And suddenly there we were, this park, and the park was not the nicest of places, but that was it. There was no greenery, no hills in sight. So no I, I think you very used bright. Word, so, sorry, I think you used the word prison, did you? Yes, yes, the, 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 the park gates were like a prison. They were okay. shut. So they were like you. I, totally, I felt shut down, totally shut down, yeah. disappointed. Shut down and shut out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And did that did that last? I mean, is that a significant part, do you think, of you as a teenager? Or did you adapt uh, quickly? Well, no, I didn't really adapt. This was a temporary home because my parents hadn't been able to sell the house in Shropshire. So we were there for two years. And then we moved out to Derbyshire to the hills. So but it was it was an experience that I probably had to have on one level, but it wasn't a nice experience. Well, the words you use make it sound like a very visceral experience. It was. So I would encourage you to go back and revisit that and write about it. You already have a beautiful title, Where Are My Hills? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Rosemary. Thank you. Anybody else? OK, well, if anybody decides that they would like to send me something, as I say, Rowan will, I'm sure, pass it on by email and I'd be delighted to take a look at it and give you some feedback. OK. So, moving on a little bit, but still focusing on home just for a moment. Um, I'm not sure if many of you have come across the plays of Tom Murphy. Uh, and if you haven't, I would suggest that you take a look at them. Plays such as Conversations on a Homecoming and The Wake. Now, there are many, but in these plays, what he does is he looks at the attitude of the community to the, to the returning emigrant. And we'll be coming back to this topic a little bit later in the talk. Um, but I just wanted to mention the names to you now. Um, he explores emigration, loss and belonging. And what came across to me very, very clearly in the people that I interviewed, and remember that I started these interviews late in 1999 and we moved on into the New Century, the first edition of the book was published in 2003. So by the time I met these people that I interviewed, most of them were quite elderly. Most of them were, you know, late 70s, perhaps coming into their 80s. Um, so first of all, it was it was a place that I had to tread very delicately because I didn't want to bring up memories that were painful and then just walk away. Um, but they were very anxious to talk about their experience and almost to a man and to a woman, the experiences of leaving the family were very similar. While there was certainly was the push pull of emigration in the case of Irish families in the 50s. In other words, one family member would go first. In those days, the biggest ethnic areas for Irish were Kilburn and Cricklewood. So the eldest brother or eldest sister would go first and then pull the next member of the family along with them and then the next one and so on. But even though it was encouraged because there really were no options, in Phyllis's own words, there was no back door, there was nothing to go home to. In Stephen Crotton's words, it was that or starvation. There literally was nothing. Still, there was a resentment within families, which was often a very poignant uh, wedge that, that then existed between the siblings for the rest of their lives, because those who remained at home in Ireland felt that the one who went got the benefit of adventure and was earning great money and had great fun and had great freedom, while the sibling who stayed at home, perhaps even though they might have got the farm, they had the burden, in their words, of elderly parents to look after. They had no adventure. They had all the suffocations of rural Ireland. So it was one of those very sad situations where each split within the family believed that they were the one who got the raw deal. Those who emigrated really would have preferred in their own minds to have stayed at home. And those who stayed at home wanted to have been given the opportunity to have adventure by being in England. So 
Oh, I said to you earlier that I would give you some statistics. Now, these are very short. I don't believe that anything can give the texture of an emigrant's life by quoting statistics. But no matter how many times I come across these, and I've come across them in subsequent research over and over again, they still shock me. They're still numbers I find it hard to get my head around. So the first one is that between in Ireland, between 1941 and 1951, so between those 10 years, four out of every five children born in this country left. Now that is an astonishing statistics st statistic in anybody's book. 80% of them went to Britain and the other 20% mostly to the United States. There would have been a scattering to Australia, New Zealand, other European countries. But the vast majority of those young people, and they were mostly young, went to Britain. Um, and those who went to America fared better. As they were leaving, what was held was called an American wake. And this was a phrase that originated in the 1800s, where those taking the emigrant ship to America, their family knew that they were never going to see them again. So the farewell was like a wake for a dead person, because essentially that separation was a death. The parents and the family would die without ever seeing that family member again. And for the most part, that remained true. That phrase was then rehabilitated, if you like, in the 1950s, that those who left an American wake was held for them if they were going to the United States. Which meant that because they knew they were not coming back again, or that it would have been incredibly difficult to leave and come back again, there was a social structure there that was ready to welcome them. If you look at the difference, for example, in the way politicians and trade unionists, for example, with Irish names are represented in all sorts of echelons of American political society. Let's just take the Kennedys for one, that they embedded themselves in the society. They became em embroiled in politics and trade unionism in the arts. The visibility of the Irish emigrant in Britain was much more low key because Everybody I came across spoke about, sure, I'll be going home. I'm only staying for a few years and I'll be going home. Those who went to America had no such fantasy. They knew that they were there to stay. So there were family structures, work structures, church structures, all to make them become part of the society that they were going to live in for the rest of their lives. And crucially, some of the things that that meant were that they had perhaps bank accounts or post office accounts, but they paid their tax, they paid their social welfare. The waves of undocumented Irish coming much later in the 1980s, that was a different situation. But those who went in the, fifth, from the 40s and 50s became embedded in the society and became tax paying citizens who, who had an official life as well as their own personal life. So many of the men in particular who emigrated to Britain thought that all of their birthdays had come at once because the construction sites paid them on what was called the lump. And I remember one year at the opening of Parliament almost creasing with laughter when I heard her in Her Majesty's speech, she tried to get her mouth around talking about the lump. And it was just so funny to hear it described in that aristocratic accent. But that's what happened. They went and they worked on the lump. And of course, like all young people, believed that this was going to last forever. Unfortunately, roll around their late 50s, their 60s, their 70s, and they often discovered that, of course, no such social welfare had been paid on their behalf, no pension, contributions, nothing. And they found themselves destitute. And it's important to say, actually, that the Irish builders were probably worse at exploiting Irish workers than British firms were. And that, that came across very, very clearly with the people I interviewed. In fact, most of them said to me, I was delighted if I got an English foreman. Because the English foreman would say, if you can do your job, that's fine. Whereas it was a kind of a hierarchy of counties in Ireland. If you came from one place, you had somebody looking down on you who might have been your foreman. 
And then if they didn't like you, you didn't get work. So the snobbery and the hierarchy kind of came with the Irish workers as well. So that's the one that's the one statistic that still manages to shock me that in that decade, 41 to 51, four out of every five children born here took, as they said, the emigrant boat. The second statistic is that the emigrant remittances, as they were called, the money that was sent home from the Irish working abroad, mainly in Britain, but also some from the United States, they were the foundation of what then became known as the Celtic Tiger, which unfortunately was no tiger at all, but quite a pussycat that disappeared rather soon, leaving a great trail of devastation in its wake. But here's the, st the statistic that sums it up for me. Now remember that these remittances were only those remittances that could be traced. So they were remittances sent either by cheques or postal orders that had to be cashed or in some way that was official. We have no idea of the amount of money that came home in birthday cards, rolled up in newspapers or sent home in an envelope with one emigrant who'd visit the other emigrant's family and hand over the money. And I remember speaking to a man who belonged to a group in Mayo, a Mayo resettlement group for emigrants. And he said that as a 14 year old child, which would have been in the mid 1950s, he got a job at the local post office where his job on a Saturday was to cycle to all of the outlying farms with the money that had come from England and the women would be waiting at the door. This was the money that was necessary to feed the family for the following week. So, so much of that would not have been documented. But here's the, the, the statistic from 1961. In 1961, the entire amount of the documented emigrant remittances came to 13.5 million pounds. That's 13.5 million. The cost of the entire education budgets for this state for primary and secondary children was 14 million pounds. So essentially, they educated a generation. And that is something that has never, to my view, been properly acknowledged, which is why I called my book an unconsidered people rather than a forgotten people. And here's the final statistic just for the moment. In 1955, 48,000 people left this country. In 1957, 58,000 people left this country. And in 1961, as many people as were born left this country. So it's just an astonishing figure of people, a constant drain. It happened again in the 1980s when over 200,000 people left. And it happened again after the crash when over 200,000 people left. So this is a this is a constant theme. Ireland exports its people, which is why at this point, I think the diaspora, the Irish diaspora uh, worldwide is at something like 47 million people. That's of those who claim some kind of Irish descent one way or another. OK, <clears throat> so moving on a little bit then from what the leaving, the uprooting was like. Let's have a look at what happened with the transplanting. Um, if you look at the play Kings of the Kilburn High Road by Jimmy Murphy, I think you get a very good sense of what we've been talking about in terms of the pain of leaving and how the emigrant often got stuck with a vision of the country that he had left and was unable to assimilate into the new culture. And another one of my interviewees, a man called Kevin Casey, spoke about his experience of managing five bars all over London, um, came to the conclusion after 40 years working there that the Irish probably assimilated less well than any other um, nationality. They just couldn't manage to make some kind of a tapestry of their lives between one country and the next. So they remained essentially on the outside. Women, not to the same extent. It, it was the men who didn't marry who probably fared worse because they didn't have a social network created around them. Um, 
so the Catholic Church obviously was a very important element in the lives of the people who left. And I made sure to interview one priest, at least, whose name was Father Fulham. And he came from the church in Quex Road, the huge parish church in, Quil in Kilburn called Quex Road. And he was a very compassionate man and quite critical also of some of the things that the Catholic Church did to let people down in terms of finances, which we'll come to in a moment. But in terms of looking after them on their arrival, he feels that the church did his best. Some of my interviewees would disagree with that, but I'm going to give you his point of view as well. So this is Father Seamus Fulham. And this is what he says. So I'd asked him what he would identify as the most difficult challenges that the Irish faced in the 1950s on their arrival in London. You know, how did they recover from that visceral sense of uprooting and manage to transplant themselves into a new place? But he says, culture shock. Everything was so completely different from what they were used to at home. They had to find solutions to many problems, often without help in some areas of their lives. Many got into difficulties because of loneliness. Even though people lived in blocks of flats surrounded by others, they were often very lonely. They ended up spending all their money in the pub or they made unsuitable marriages and fell away from the church. Some of the Irish were very lucky in that they met caring landladies. They were only young fellows and these landladies mothered them. Others weren't so lucky. The church tried to help out both with the social clubs and with other more practical difficulties. I remember on one occasion during the 50s there was heavy snow, which lasted for a good many months, so there was no work to be had. A priest by the name of Father Dorr from Quex Road Church in Kilburn helped out as best he could during that time. He got the men to clear away the snow from around the church. He paid them a couple of pounds whenever he could. And that was a lot of money in those days. He did that for weeks and weeks. And he wasn't the only one. Other parishes did their best too. And the St. Vincent de Paul was very good at helping out those who had fallen on hard times. However, there was one big problem which most young Irish men had to face. And that was isolation. They would come home from work, get their dinner, and then have to sit there looking at the four walls. There was no television, maybe just a radio. They were people who weren't used to reading, and so the natural thing was to go out to the pub to seek out company, and that brought problems. In many parishes, the church came up with the idea to form social clubs so that after work, and particularly at weekends, the men would come and play games of cards or darts and socialise with other men. Many marriages were made between men and women who met at those Catholic social clubs. Those clubs were a tremendous asset to many people who helped them in a lot of ways. And the clubs also kept them in contact with the church and their duties. I believe the church did everything it could to help the Irish here in the 1950s, very much so. For example, because of the culture in Ireland at the time, and I'm not blaming the church or the government or any individuals for that, but because of the culture, if a girl got pregnant outside of marriage, she had to disappear overnight. In the Ireland of the 1950s, it appears that there was only one sin. Church authorities tended only to stress the sixth and ninth commandments. A fellow could come home drunk, beat up his wife, kick her out of bed, but the only sin, it seemed, was breaking the sixth or the ninth commandment. For the day of judgment, there's nothing mentioned about the sixth or the ninth. When I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was thirsty, did you give me to drink? When I was sick or in prison, did you come to visit me? A Father Fulham was a priest who was widely respected by his parishioners, but there were others. And Kevin Casey, the man I mentioned earlier, who managed all of these bars, he told me that in many cases, the social clubs run by the church were run at a profit. 
and the profit was used to fix the church roof or to buy equipment for the local school or to put something into the local hospital or whatever it happened to be, but some, some kind of a finite need for finances. And often, once the roof was completed, once the money had been got, those clubs were closed down, leaving these men now coming into their 60s and 70s with essentially nowhere to go, no sense of community, no sense of family. And Father Fulham himself mentions pubs there. Kevin Casey mentions the fact that he managed five of them. And we all know that the pub played and probably continues to play quite a central role in Irish culture, changing a little bit perhaps um, since COVID. But pubs were certainly something that everybody mentioned either in a positive or a negative way. And one of the things which I discovered during my research for this, going back into the 1990s, reading medical journals, even like The Lancet, all of the studies showed that although, yes, there was a reputation for the fighting Irish, and they certainly did fight the times, um, that very few of those young men arrived in Britain with a drinking problem. The problem started after they arrived because they were kicked out. The landladies didn't want them after their evening meal, so they weren't welcome to stay in their lodgings or their digs for the most part. And the only place where there was some kind of communal activity, some sense of family and society was actually in the pub. And one of the biggest of those would have been the Crown in Cricklewood, where I spent some very interesting evenings. It is now a 145 room Moran Hotel, right? So Kilburn and Cricklewood have changed completely. The ethnic Irish have all gone. They've moved on to other places. It's now with Romanians signs for halal meats, um, Muslim communities, people from the Philippines, the whole ethnic diversity of the region has, of the area has changed. But in, in the pub, we mentioned the lump earlier, and what happened was because the men had nowhere to go after they had been on their building sites, um, the place where they went to get their check cashed, because remember they had no bank accounts, they were all very temporary about their lives in London. They were all going home after a year or two. So they didn't need to have anything official like that. They just needed to earn a whack of money and go home as a successful emigrant. And that would be the end of that. And in fact, a friend of mine, a builder, a young man, uh, well, we were all young in the 1980s. Um, he went over to London to get some expertise on building sites there because nothing was happening here during the recession. And when he arrived, he got a job and this older man was talking to him and said, well, John, how long are you going to stay? And John said, oh, I'm, I'm just staying for a few years, just until the worst of the recession is over in Ireland. Then I'm going to go home and start my own business. And the man nodded and said to him, and how many years are you going to stay? He kept pushing it. How many years are you going to stay? And John kept saying, I don't know, a few. It'll be grand. It's just a few. And the man pointed to a very elderly gentleman in the corner of the room who was sweeping up the detritus on the building site. He said, see Joe over there? He said that to me 45 years ago and he's still here. So my friend John went and booked his passage home that day. That was it. He wasn't falling into that trap, but a lot of them did. So where could you go to get your cheque cashed? The only place you could go to was the pub. And the subbies, had a very cosy arrangement with pubs like the Crown, where the cheque for the builder, the young, the, the man on the building site, was handed in at the beginning of the evening. And then they drank for the night. And then what was left out of the cheque, they got back with a little something for the subby for his trouble. And that's how they were paid. There's a completely iniquitous system. So they would have been better off, in fact, paying tax with what they drank in order to get their, what was left at the end of the night. And they never got it before closing time. All bills were settled at closing time. And this was the same uh, pub. The Crown was the same pub outside which the men were picked up as day laborers and would just queue up outside there every morning. It was one of the biggest pickup places for the subbies. Um, so if you had fallen foul of your subby the night before in the pub, you were just dispatched for the day, you didn't get work. So it was a very, very, very difficult way to earn your living. And many of those men 
fell through the cracks. Um, I'm just going to read you one last little piece here, just about the role of the Catholic Church, uh, which happened much later on. And this was when I went back several times um, in, the, in the early 2000s, and I had done some work for the Cricklewood Homeless Concern, which was a hostel in Cricklewood, which looked after the needs of mostly homeless uh, Irish men. And we had to fight for something, which I will now read you. Back in the early 2000s, I joined the staff of the Cricklewood Homeless Concern in an overnight sleepout. The CHC, as it was then known, was a charity that had dedicated itself since 1983 to looking after mostly elderly and homeless Irish men. These men had arrived in London decades earlier lured by the promise of work in post-war reconstruction. In their later life, many had fallen through the social and economic cracks after years of unofficial employment on the lump. The system that paid construction workers in cash off the books, and as a result, no pension provision or social welfare payments were ever made on their behalf. Our sleep out was to protest the Catholic Church's plans to close the CHC hostel and used a church-owned site for more profitable purposes, apartments in other words. We positioned ourselves along with our cardboard mattresses and our sleeping bags on a street close to Cardinal Murphy O'Connor's residence for maximum effect. There is a happy ending to that story. The many and varied protests and objections to the sale of the site were successful and a brand new hostel was built opening in 2004 which now operates under the name of Ashford Place. Run by a specialist staff as well as volunteers, the hostel offers not just housing support to those clients who need it, but also keeps a focus on social inclusion, health, well-being, and community action. Ashford Place is still thriving today. So there were those two kind of conflicting um, attitudes towards the church help. Yes, sure, in the snow, you know, there was a few pounds being given to men who cleared up. But in terms of the structural help, which a lot of people needed, their stories to me told me that they felt the church had let them down, that it didn't protect them or speak up for them in ways that they should have. One notable exception to this, by the way, never mind his later ignominy, um, you may have heard of Bishop Eamon Casey who um, tarnished his own reputation, shall we say, in the 1990s by having an affair with a married, with, sorry, with an American woman with whom he had a child. Uh, to me, his biggest sin was that he denied the child. If you looked at the two of them, there was no doubt. They were father and son, absolutely. But before all of this had happened, Eamon Casey, when he was a priest, had actually worked in Kilburn, Cricklewood, Brent, Edgware, all of those heavy ethnically Irish areas and had done wonders in helping them to find accommodation. So that's just a little side note there. So here's writing prompt number two for you before we move on to the next section of the talk. But actually, just before we do, I know we have Q&A at the end, but just is there any question that anybody is, wants to ask at this point? Because we can certainly give a few minutes to it if there is. No? Okay. Right. Here's the writing prompt. You have to leave home. What are the things for you that are emblematic of home? What do you take with you? And what do you leave behind? So what personal possessions for you sum up what home means and what are the things you'd be happy enough to leave behind. And again, we'll give that about three minutes. Okay. So this is really looking at, you know, the sort of things that you would take with you to help you transplant yourself somewhere else. So the elements that you would take with you that would help you 
make a new home, things that are precious. So anybody want to share? And again, I'll have to rely on Rowan to tell me if somebody has their hand up. Yeah, um, Alan has his hand raised. Okay. Uh, there are a few people, but um, yeah. Good. Alan first and... Music. I, I've never been one for uh, clothes or decorations or things that uh, hang around my neck or anything like that. But the thing that really has to come with me has always been music. And when I first moved away from my home in the early 1970s, it was my records, <laughs> the LPs that had to come with me. I didn't care about anything else. Um, and everything else could be bought, could be got, you know, or, or, or done without. Uh, but it was it was music, and to a somewhat a lesser extent, books. Okay. Uh, for me. And did that help you then when you were settling somewhere new? Did you feel that you'd familiar it, friends around? It so you? did. It so did because music. I would know the pieces that would take me from a dark mood to a light one, or from a uh, from a. a, a in, into a reflective mood when mm -hmm. I want, you know, that's always been the thing I can, music has, has, has been a thing that always has made, given me the uh, pathway from one mental state to another, if you like, and particularly out of depression or despondency. Um, and how would you describe your musical taste? Oh, Led Zeppelin. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, you... or, or quite 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 broad uh, so okay. um uh, anything uh and again it depends what what i'm trying to achieve okay. uh, with a particular piece of listening but something beautiful um and classical yeah absolutely and i hope you held on to all of those records alan because they'd be worth a fortune they are still there Good man. <laughs> and I presume if you to carry music with you today, it might be a Spotify account rather than all of your records. Indeed, yes. <laughs> okay, so music and books and and your reading taste. Um uh, uh Jane Austen, PG Woodhouse, um and factual stuff. Okay, a good eclectic mix. Okay, so what would what would it not? It wouldn't pain you then to leave any of the other things behind, would it? These were the clothes. Ones... I can forget. Okay. Uh, pictures. Yeah, but yeah. Okay, so they're the two essentials to your home: music yeah. and books. Okay. Yeah. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you, Alan. Anybody <laughs> else? Yeah, Caroline has her hand raised, and Ronnie. Okay, great. Oh, we would go to Caroline first, and then Ronnie. Um, I grew up in an army family, so we never lived anywhere longer than three years. Okay. Um, so it was constant change. Um, but like a, Alan, the one thing that went with me all the time was a limited amount of stuff that you could take with you were my books. Your books, okay. Notably, uh, Georgette Hare. Uh -huh. Some of the old ones will probably remember what she used to write about and I never, you know, if I felt unhappy or sad or dislocated, I would reach for them again and again. Um, but the other things when you were saying made up a home and what would you miss were things such as um, having warm presence, someone to listen and to care when you were talking mm -hmm. about things. Um, and familiar menus of meals. Right. And the sense of your home, you know, with the, you know, the rooms that had sort of under polish and, you know, the rooms that, um, that that's really interesting because and so on. a lot of the people that I interviewed, one of the things which um, came up again and again was food, mm. food and tea, a particular brand of tea that they wanted from Ireland that made them feel at home or a particular mm -hmm. type of bread that would make them feel at home. And in fact, you've touched on something really interesting because even around Christmas now on Irish television, there is a picture of, let's say, the, the young, you know, successful professional emigrant family in their beautiful apartment in New York, 
calling home on Christmas Day, but they have the Irish bacon and sausages in the background for breakfast. So again, oh. to give them a sense of home. So moving every three years, that must have been pretty dislocating, Caroline, was it? Yes, I do remember doing the Middle Ages three times at three different schools. <laughs> Those were before the, uh, you know, the, oh, you know, this program that, yeah. yes, before that. Uh, so I knew a lot about the Middle Ages. Yes, oh. it was very dislocating. And of yeah. course, it's, you appreciate then the, the importance where, you know, like when children start secondary school, it's important that they get there exactly where all the others are because all yeah. the links that are made are in that early yeah. Yeah. session. So if you sort of come along and, you know, three years in, yeah. you're an outsider. Absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah. My next sisters were identical twins. So, of course, they went together. Right. So they had each other too. They had each other, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, Caroline, you can always fall back on the fact that you're now an expert in the Middle Ages. <laughs> well, exactly, yes. <laughs> Absolutely useless now. You brought that with you. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. But I, I know what you mean about books. They they would be for me. I don't know how I'd manage mm. them all. And I don't know what I'd manage to leave behind. But certainly books would help me make a new home. Absolutely. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Uh, Sandra? Sorry. Thank you. Um, I agree about food. But oh, I know that's been said. But also songs. I mean, you know, I... I, I grew up in London, but I was surrounded by an Irish community. Um, when I was very little, I actually had a really strong Irish accent. But in the 70s, you know, my school teacher sort of made sure I would change that. Okay. I don't think it was, anyway. But, you know, I remember so many times at family gatherings that people would tell stories of very evocative. And I think, you know, stories are part of the ways that we help to make sense out of things, out, out of our lives. You know, novels and stories and poems, they help us understand all of the things about us that are human and our links with others and our connections. And stories and poems, at least, they're very, very easy for us to carry with us wherever we go. That's a lovely thing to have that you would take with you from your home. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Ronnie. Ronnie? Yeah. Honey, thanks. Um, you know, yes, I can relate perfectly to the taking the music. My music was very different. My music was Leonard Cohen. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, Led Zeppelin for me. Is, is that something that, that makes you feel at home when you hear Yes, Leonard I mean, Leonard Cohen, Cohen fed okay. me. I mean, you know, amazingly and everything. Yes. But, I, you know, I can remember going to, going to the pub, you know, which seemed like, a, and I think it was actually quite a local pub. Yes, um, so it was community. It was, but it yes. wasn't my yeah. community. <laughs> and I think, you know, with, with, with maybe also within, you know, if, if so many children are, were leaving the Irish um, rural yeah. areas as well, yeah. then that thing of being the last one left, you know, yes. probably, uh, and, and leaving as well, probably wasn't even that uncommon no, it was, it was either. Very, very common indeed, very common. And I think, you know, the, what all, again, what emerged from all of the people I spoke to was, you know, like your Leonard Cohen, like the stories, like the books, like Alan's music, all mm. of the, what they would try to do was surround themselves with things that at least gave them a sense of, if not recreating the home that they had come from, but creating a new home for mm. themselves. And you've clearly done that for yourself as well. So oh. well done. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Ronnie. Can I say something? Sure. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm sorry, I don't know how to raise my hand. Um, <laughs> removal vans I've known. Moved and moved and moved and moved and moved and I went to eight different schools. So I've had time to think about this and actually it's been quite good for me to do. So I have a finger drum which I play which enlivens me every day, so that's my music. My yoga mat. Okay. Um, the view across the valley here with the layered sounds and colours. Bracelli Hills in the Distance, beckoning. A few books and some fiction, some non-fiction. Um, and an inherited set of little drawers, which were my parents, filled with postcards. It's about this big, quite small, and I love Lovely. that. And hope. 
at home. That has to be packed everywhere. And did you find that the removal van got smaller and smaller as time went on? No. Less and less, bigger and bigger? <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you, Rosary. Uh, I think I see Paul's hand up. Yeah. Um, really what I take with me, my music is always with me, but it seems strange to, for me to say what I would take with me is the sun. And I don't mean the weather because we we don't get much sun here. When I've traveled to the Southern Hemisphere, I'm completely disorientated. Um, the sea is on the east of me when I'm away in America, whereas right. on the west of me now. Uh, and it's just that feeling of being completely lost because the sun is setting in the wrong place. The tides are in the wrong place. Right. Um, yeah. So you lose your orientation. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So you um, kind of take it with you as a sort of a personal compass. Well, uh, I can remember doing something in, in, in Argentina, in Patagonia, um, and looking at the sea and thinking, that's home. Because I can see the, I can see the sunset. Well, well, home is actually behind me. It's on the right uh, side. And I felt quite lonely with the sun, sun and the sea in the wrong place. It's interesting. It's a sense of being again dislocated. Yeah. Because it wasn't as th things weren't as they were at home. Yeah. yeah okay. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And if you want to expand on that and send me something, please do. I'd be delighted to receive it. So, I think you know what what we're getting from all of those lovely readings is a sense of how important it is to have that sense of location, connection. And we go right back to the notion of pilgrimage again. But that's why the pilgrims set off, you know, for some illumination, some sense of connection, some belonging to something better. Um, and, you know, I think that's encapsulated in all of these ideas of home. So the immigrants, emigrants, similarly, were trying to recreate for themselves a sense of belonging in a culture which was quite alien. And an awful lot of those men, as we have seen, who went failed, not, not because of their shortcomings as such, but because the game was rigged, the system was against them, and they ended up suffering a great deal more than perhaps the women who went and than the men who married. So th what we've been talking about a lot is the fate of those single men of which they are legion. And I think we might have a little clip at the end of this if, um, if Rowan, Rowan's techie stuff is working for her later on that you'll be able to see. And don't worry, Rowan, if it's not, we're getting the sense of it anyway. OK, so the next thing I want to, to come on to, which we're, we're coming you know, towards the, the last couple of, um, of issues that I want to highlight with you, is the experience of women which was completely different from the experience of men. And I think I mentioned to you at the outset, and there's a very a lovely book by a, a woman called Claire Barrington, who looks at the um, patterns of Irish emigration over the years. And the, as I said to you earlier, the Irish pattern for women was very, very different, that they emigrated on their own. And both Sean O'Fuelon and other writers who had looked around them at the time and said, you know, speaking to young women about why they were going. And he says something like, you know, they looked at these, the, the, the sad faces and the stooped backs of their mothers and grandmothers and decided, none of this is for me. And they voted with their feet. And that's exactly what they did. And a lot of the women that I interviewed in this book had gone for adventure. Some of them who only went to, intended to go for a little while, but then ended up staying 40, 50 years. And one of the things that differentiates the experience of the, the men and the women, first of all, would be that women, for the most part, would gravitate towards the church, the Catholic church, Sunday mass, which brought with it a community, which brought with it neighbours, bringing children to school so that their, their network became a little bit wider and they became more rooted in the community than the men that we've been speaking about earlier. Um, Anne O'Neill, another interviewee in the book, talks about the horrors of rural Roscommon, which you heard a little bit about from Stephen at the beginning of this session. And, you know, no electricity, no running water, nothing, no creature comforts whatsoever. She couldn't wait to leave. She really needed to get out. And people like Anne, um, who would have gone with other, would have, would have, when she married, 
her mother-in-law and her sister-in-law moved in to look after the children while Anne and her husband always worked. So at the same time, they managed to run a boarding house. And in that way, with you like a family community working, helping people to put down roots and to get a, a status in the community and to be able to stay. So Kathleen Morrissey was a woman I interviewed and, and coincidentally, Ireland's a very small place. Um, some friends of mine were at a wedding in London um, just a few weeks ago and one of them called me and said, there's somebody here who'd like to speak to you. Now, it's well over 20 years since I spoke to Kathleen. Kathleen was at the same wedding, now in her 80s. So we had a great chat and we were reliving the memories that she had shared with me of being um, a young, a very young girl working in Schweppes. So Kathleen was a very feisty young girl. She left um, Ireland at 14 uh, and went to stay with her sister. So I asked her, what it was like and what it was like working because of course there would have been no work for her here. So she says it was very very difficult. We learned to be independent at a very early age. I got the room of my own eventually through a contact of my uncle a Mr Kennedy who played in a band in Percy Road. My room was with his family. The rent wasn't a lot but we never ate much. We kept our money for buying dresses and going dancing. When I think of my own children and how things were for them growing up, they were really mollycoddled in comparison. I had to have three jobs to pay my rent. I worked full time in Schweppes and on Saturdays I worked in Woolworths in Kilburn High Road. I had another part time job a few evenings a week in Evans. My first job was in Schweppes. I was working on the belt, as it was called. All the bottles used to go round and round and we used to have to put labels on them and see that the tops were on correctly. We were working with English girls. They were all English, except for myself and my friend Maureen. The others used to be always saying that we weren't doing it right and they used to pick on us a lot. They used to say, you Irish, you don't know how to do it properly. Or what are you doing here? They'd make nasty comments about us being Irish. That only happened to me in Schweppes though. I didn't come across it in any other places. And so we found our own way of getting back at them. As the bottles went around, we'd take one where the top wasn't on right, shake it hard. Then we'd squirt it all over the English girls. And of course, we'd get called to the office. We were always getting into trouble over that. Maureen used to get into trouble for name calling too. She was great for giving back as good as she got. I'd say a few things back to them too, but not like Maureen. We literally worked on top of one another in the factory. So it was at two close quarters, really. No wonder we fought. And Kathleen had a series of jobs. She was always employed. Phyllis, the other woman I spoke to you about earlier, got a job as a bookkeeper, made her way up to be an accountant. All of them worked in very satisfying jobs, being given opportunities that they never would have been given had they stayed in Ireland. But the most important thing that they had in common, all of them, no matter where they came from, or what they worked at was their Fridays and Saturdays when they went to the Galtimore. And the Galtimore Dance Hall in Kilburn, it's now gone. And it, there was the Galtimore, the Garyon, the Hammersmith, the Palais. There was hundreds of dance halls all over London, but the Galtimore was the hub, the Irish. So she'd say that when they would get there, they, they, they'd all get dressed up, they'd go out for the night, and they'd all go to the Galtimore. The entire Irish community would meet there. And it wasn't just for dancing. They'd meet, if they needed a carpenter, they'd find a carpenter there. They'd find a plumber. They'd find somebody who'd fix their roof. And many, many marriages were made there. Um, I spent a couple of interesting nights there as well. I don't think I've ever been anywhere quite like it. And I describe it in the opening chapter of this. It was, I brought another friend along with me because I had my notebook and my pen and I needed somebody to hold my stuff. And she said, yeah, 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 I'll come along for that. I'll come along for the fun. And to this day, to this day, the experience just transfixes her. And she says, it was like walking into the intergalactic bar in Star Wars. The range of costumes, of get-ups, of dances, of it was just an extraordinary place. But it was a wonderful meeting place for the Irish. So that's... That's that level, those women who managed to 
get the freedom that they were looking for and to get employment and to move up in the world and to have a satisfying life. But there was, of course, the other side to that question. And the other side to that question is dealt with in the book by a, a woman called Sheila Dillon, who said to me very poignantly over 20 years ago, I may have to account for what I did to the Lord after I die, but I thought I was doing what was right. And what she was doing was she was meeting pregnant Irish girls off the train at, at Houston Station. And she was such a practiced maternity nurse, she knew by looking at them whether they were pregnant. And she and many others, there were lots of societies, there was this, the Vincent Paul, there was Societies of Mary, there were all sorts of different charitable societies that met those girls because the biggest possible sin a woman could commit in Ireland in the 1950s was to become pregnant outside of marriage. And to that end, from 1922 to 1998, the so-called mother and baby homes in this country, which were mother and baby institutions, they were not worthy of the name home. Uh, young women were locked away there to have their babies. It was what we call an architecture of containment. And within that architecture, 56,000 women over those years gave birth to children. And those children were for the most part trafficked, both to England and also to the United States. Babies were bought and sold and the transactions were facilitated by the religious orders. Ireland was not unique in having mother and baby institutions, but we are unique in the fact that we had the highest proportion of such institutions in Europe. And our figures show us that 9,000 9, babies died during those years. You may remember back in 2017 when the, the um, Tuam babies crisis or scandal hit the international airwaves. And that was where 800 babies were found buried in an underground tank. The government set up a commission of inquiry, which eventually reported in 2021 and was unfortunately a whitewash. So those women who suffered being exported like that in order to have their children or who suffered from the mother and baby homes, their suffering has never really been acknowledged and they have never really received, the women in the institutions have never received a proper apology from the state. This is one of the social problems that we have always exported from this country. Abortion has only been legalised here in recent years and again a very limited form. So throughout, you know, from the 1960s on, on a, on a woman's chart, for example, there was a little notation, PFI, which was understood by all of the medical personnel to mean pregnant from Ireland, either going for an abortion which they couldn't procure at home or else to have their babies which were then adopted. And there was a lot of mixed race babies as well, which of course certainly could never come back to rural Ireland. It was indeed the, the biggest shame. Um, Rowan, I'm not sure how much time we have left. Can you illuminate me a little bit? Yes, we're at quarter to eight now, actually. So, um, yeah. Just another 15 minutes or so? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I just want to talk a little bit about the, the last session that I had uh, to, to discuss with you, which is that whole um, mythology around coming home. Now, Phyllis articulates it very wisely when she talks about the fact that, you know, if you did come home, was it going to be a different place? Um, she's a very astute lady, always was. And there was a great divide in this, and Phyllis uh, alludes to it in her piece there, where she talks about the fact that um, women, once they had children and grandchildren, felt that, for better or worse, that was the place where they were rooted. Um, Husbands, as they became older, as they retired, still harboured a wish to come back to Ireland. Uh, this is something that you find in the plays of Tom Murphy that I mentioned to you earlier, and also Kevin Casey speaks about it. He says even when he used to go home on holidays as the successful emigrant, which he was, a bar manager of five pubs, did very well. Um, 
what he said, the, the question, he was from Ennis in County Clare in the west of the country, very poor in those days. And he would say almost the first thing that people would say to you when they met was, when are you going back? Because there was a fear that if you stayed, being more skilled and more educated, you were now going to take whatever job might be available for somebody else. So he said, I never felt welcome. Now, he never returned. Um, Phyllis attempted to return and it didn't work out. Other families that I spoke to based their return on the fantasy of the two week holiday. And again, it's something that Tom Murphy looks at in his work. So these, the people, the emigrants, men and women felt this great pressure that whatever holidays they had, their two weeks of every year was to go home and show that they were successful and to bring money with them. Money which they then left in Ireland, they spent treating everybody and then went back to start the same process all over again, even if it meant that they were living in one room without any kind of appreciable level of comfort for themselves. So those who returned, returned to an Ireland which I would suggest had never existed because the Ireland that they left was extremely impoverished, but yet it was home and they were young and they were able to mythologize a little bit about their hills, their valleys and their rivers and their homes. So that over time, those kind of memories turn into a kind of a mythology, which reality rarely lives up to. So that those who did come back and who bought plots of land inevitably ran into difficulties with the locals where they lived because they came back able to afford something which the locals were not able to afford for themselves. So they were already, they were always outsiders. And that's what they said. They were outsiders when they were in Britain and they were outsiders when they managed to go home again. Some of them, in fact, sold up again and went back, losing a great deal of money in the process. So a lot of the stories were not happy. Some were, but a lot weren't. And I think the ones that were happy uh, were those who had kept a more realistic contact with home by coming back frequently to their heart home to Ireland, by understanding something about the economy and the area, by preparing people for the fact that they were coming back. And then finally, when they retired, it was possible. Um, and it's, it's to me, it's, it's really difficult when you when I was speaking to these people, how to understand why that notion of only staying for a temporary time, for a short period of time and coming home, how that didn't happen. And paradoxically, it's because there's such a short distance between Britain and Ireland. It's only a boat ride of a few hours and you're home. So it was always in the back of their minds, well, sure that it's only a few hours, sure I can go home any time. And so they didn't. Whereas the, the comparison I've made or the contrast with those who went to America, they knew that wasn't a possibility. So they put down roots an awful lot more quickly. So I had a third writing prompt, which I might leave you just to do for yourselves. And it would be to imagine that sense of coming back home, coming back to your heart home again after a long period of time away. And how might you feel? And what might you expect and what lives up to your expectations and what doesn't and to see what kind of an experience to try and empathize with what kind of an experience it might have been um, for all of those who did return and for anybody who's interested in acquiring this from their library or however you want to it's called an unconsidered people the irish in london okay we have I think we've got about 10 minutes for a q a if i haven't you know sort of talked you all into submission uh, yeah, i'm very yeah. happy to answer yeah. questions Catherine, I'm wondering, um maybe it would if i can try and show that clip from the oh, please do. now i think that would really um sort of set a scene in in your final writing prompt as well that would be lovely thank um, you Ron. let's all positive uh, thoughts that positive thoughts. <laughs> I love the country, countryside. It's like heaven on earth. Away from all the traffic and the hustle and the bustle. 
Cortés. Can you tell me the way to Kim Mac Thomas, please? Ten minutes, quarter of an hour from it now. Yeah. Ah, oh, that's great. I bet they don't know me. I'm Jim Shanahan. You're joking. Not. This is Eileen. This is Eileen. Mary. 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 Yes. Yeah. Not Eileen. Yeah. I couldn't believe it was twenty years. Yeah. You'd be amazed to have the time go, wouldn't you? Right, don't it? Yeah. Have you, have you got some place to stay? I'm staying with Kathleen. Oh, are you going yeah. to stay with Kathleen? Yeah. Yes. I would like to come back one good. When you're working like a younger, you don't take much notice. But as you get on, it's nice to be back in the home country. Yeah. Thanks, Ron. No matter how many times I see that, I think it's just unbearably poignant. It really is. Very powerful. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's, well, it's, actually, it's five, it's five to eight. So we, we really have, um, yeah, come right to sort of the end of our time in a way. I don't know if anybody has anything burning um, they would uh, want to ask at this point. Um, that's uh, oh, Seamus. Yes, would you? Yeah, just uh, a couple of um, parts, I suppose. Um, the I I was one of the lucky ones. I left Ireland in uh, 1987, 35 years ago, and um, I I was as a, I was one of the lucky ones in as much as uh, my wife and two kids came with me. Um, and we had intended, uh, as Catherine said, there we had intended coming over here for a few years, making a few bob. And going back to Ireland, but um, we we started off and we lived in a flat in Hackney in East London. Mm -hmm. now, anyone, uh, Catherine will probably know that Hackney at that time wasn't a great place to be. Um, and uh, we decided that um, we decided that uh, with about after about nine months. That if we hadn't uh, got somewhere uh, other than Hackney, we were going to go back to Ireland. We weren't going to stay any longer. And again, uh, we had I'd I'd got a, a good job, and um, at at that particular time I was making huge money. But we were able to get a mortgage and buy a house. Uh, this house that I'm still in, in fact, until for another month or so but um, we we left Ireland at that time there was Marion and I and the two kids and we only brought what we could fit in the car um, and uh, music being one of the most important things because I was involved um, in Irish traditional music back in Ireland now I, I must say that um, in 1954, Goldtis Kiltory Aaron um, formed its first branch of traditional, the traditional Irish music group. Uh, in 54, they formed their first branch in London. And in the next couple of years, there were four branches, uh, five in fact, formed in London at the time. And then they spread uh, Manchester and Liverpool and whatever. But they were huge, they were a huge help at that time 
to people that were coming over from Ireland because people that were here that, that could play music, they got involved on the music scene. Now, obviously, before Coltis was formed, there was a big music scene here anyway, and um, a big traditional Irish music scene. And um, But people um, heard of Coltis Caltorier and being organised in London, people in Ireland. And of course, it was, uh, if they knew someone here that was involved, they could uh, get a lot of information from them when they landed, you know. And the same, of course, in 1954, the um, London Irish Centre in Camden. That was an Irish Centre, yeah, they were terrific, that, yeah. That, that, that was from, the, that was opened yeah. in 1954. Yeah. And I mean, they, they went to the stage that, uh, and again, that was from that was opened by the Catholic Church. But uh, I mean, they had people waiting at the, the trains that had come yeah. from yeah. Uh, Hollyhead and the likes, mm -hmm. and uh, they gave advice to people and and actually took them to the Irish Centre and had places that they could put them up for a few nights while they were getting sorted over yep. here. Which was a great well, help at the yeah. time. You know? Yeah, no, and, and it was massive. it was really important for a lot of people that there was that kind of safety net, but. Very, so many slipped through it, yeah. And of course, very, the eighties then very, were a, were a different. Oh, that's a different right. Kind of fish, and yeah. I I got involved then, and of course, nowadays you have uh, the Irish Elderly Advice Network in London, which is doing Trojan work for for you know the forgotten Irish, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people that. A lot of Irish people that had been over here most of their lives and lived into old age and died over here. And um, I know I was involved in, with a, a couple with the Irish Elderly uh, Network uh, for a couple of old people that died over here, Irish people. And nobody knew where they were from. Yeah. Nobody knew if they had any relations. Mm -hmm. And they put uh, the... the um, organization did a good bit of research on him and, and got him uh, sent their body sent back home for burial and saw to, I mean, there was one man that was buried over here and nobody knew anything about him, but there was a crowd at his funeral. Yeah. There was a, there was a big write up in the Irish post about him trying to find out who he was. And yeah. other than the fact that he was Irish, nobody knew, but, having uh, the article haven't appeared in the Irish Post, um, there was a huge crowd turned up for his funeral, you know. Out of respect, yeah. Out yeah, of respect. Sense of community, and, and, yeah. And it was absolutely great. And the, again, the Irish Elderly Advice Network have sent so many people back, back to Ireland yep. just for holidays. Yes. That yep. hadn't been back for 50 and 60 years, you know. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, no, a, lot, a lot of good work. And of work. course, they sent chaperones with them for to look after yep. them. But, um, but yeah, the, the, the music scene, um, I, I know since I came over here in 87, um, I got a lot of phone calls and actual letters from people, uh, in Ireland. Um, in, in fact, there was people in Mayo, now I'm from Wexford, but there was people in Mayo that I knew through Coltis, uh, people in Limerick. And they had sons and daughters coming over here, um, starting out as uh, teachers. And, you know, they were, they were only in maybe 19, 20 years of age, mm. but didn't know anybody over here. Mm. And would I be able to um, contact them when they get over? Mm. And I said, well, why not contact them before they come over? And I can talk them through what they exactly. need to do. And, and that, that kind of a network is so yeah it's so important and, yeah uh, yeah we i've put a lot of people in touch and we're good friends even still you know yeah yeah home and abroad and um it's 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 just a, just a, out of interest by the way there's a book there's an online uh book published by did you know Catherine? did you know dr reg hall no over here no um reg uh, he's still alive and hale and hearty in fact i was talking to him he's 87. okay um, i was talking to him last week but he did um his doctorate uh, for his doctorate he did um, 
a book online. He published it online. It's about 900 pages. And he called it A Few Tunes of Good Music. Okay. And it's a history of Irish traditional music in London from 1800 to 1980. Oh, it's fascinating. And apart from being a history of Irish traditional music, it is such a social history of what people left in Ireland and what they found when they came here. And obviously it ties in with everything you've said there about um, the hardship that they came into. And um, he mentions as well, of course, back into the, up into the 50s, then the formation of Cortus and, and the Irish Centre and these places. To, to try and help well, out. Thank, thank you for that. Thank you for that recommendation. I will certainly look that up. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and hopefully now it's still online. Um, but if if you can't find it, I actually downloaded it. I have it on my computer, and I'm I, honestly, it it's one of these books that you can just go into and read. Just pick out sections of it and read it sure. over and over and over. Yeah. It's unbelievably good, you know. Great. Well, um, the music is a great way into looking at the society that existed. Absolutely. It's a brilliant yes. window into that that's whole right. area. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And, and of course, uh, again, the, the drinking, um, and Red actually mentions this in his book as well. Um, the, uh, the Irish got a, a very bad reputation for drinking a lot. Mm -hmm. But as he said, a lot of the um, guys that got involved with the music uh, obviously, the the only place for to have the sessions was in the pubs and in the Galty Moor and all these uh, other places where a lot of them played. But it was a, a, a big drinking culture. But he said that the guys that were involved in the music, there was never any problems with uh, fighting or rows or anything else, you know. Yeah, yeah, their focus was, was other. Yeah, absolutely. They, they had the other, they had the focus of the music. So, yeah, yeah. Um, it was something for them to do. Great, thank but, you, uh, Seamus. Thanks for that. No problem. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Seamus. Um, I'm just I think we have gone past eight o'clock now, so I sort of feel we better draw it to a close. But I know there's loads more to stay. I, I'd, I'd love to sort of talk more, but um, I feel um, we have come to the end. Well, I, I mean, what I did want to say, I just sort of listening to you, Seamus, there talking about what you could get in your car. There's a there's a bit in the book, isn't there, Catherine, where you're talking about what you can what can you. Uh, what is it? What? How, how far you can walk? With that's right. Case, and that sort of determines where you kind of end up when you when you land in the station. Um, but I also thought, um, yes, mu music's come up there for a lot of people, and obviously yeah. music is a a, a a theme of our our project as well. Yeah. And and what I put um, for the writing prompt about what's in your bag, well, actually, I always carry a tin whistle. <laughs> Okay, perfect. Yeah, and I Instant suppose, music. Yeah, and that Instant to me is, um, yeah, it's so very portable, but also very much connects me with my, my Irish heritage. Sure, great. Sorry, Seamus, you have your hand. I, I just wanted to say before, before you finish up, um, a huge um, congratulations and thanks uh, to Catherine Dunn there for an exceptionally interesting uh, talk. Thank very you very much. Well. Yes. Very thank, well. you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. It's great to meet you all. Maybe we can do it again sometime. Yeah, it's been great. it's been wonderful. And another line that from the book actually um, is there's a bit where you talk about memories in flight. Yes. That moment when relating past experiences for the benefit benefit of an attentive listener becomes highly charged. Yeah. I sort of feel like we've we've certainly had a bit of that tonight as well, both in what you've shared and what, what other people have, have um, responded to, how they've responded to your writing prompts as well. So very grateful to you, Catherine. Um, My pleasure. Also very grateful to, to everyone who's taken part tonight. And I know I haven't managed to read um, all the comments out, um, but thank you. Um, there is one comment, actually, I might just draw attention to as, as a sort of parting um, uh, glass, maybe. <laughs> which is from Jenny. Uh, um, I hope she, she'd she be okay for me to, to read this out, but she was sort of saying that this is causing me to rethink what, what is a pilgrimage. 
if you are sent where you don't really want to go from somewhere you don't want to leave you feel you're only going temporarily so you leave your heart your love of home where you feel you belong are you a pilgrim so very interesting uh, question very interesting so something to think about yeah um so um i was going to um to sh to share a, a song at the end but i feel like we have kind of run out of time but i just say that if anybody wanted to um put what they've written tonight if you wanted to put that on the map you'd be welcome to do that but also um we are later in the project we we are um going to be holding some uh, a sort of song songwriting workshops with rachel um and uh so you that perhaps some some of what you've written we might be able to develop in that way um and so yes just to say what the next session is as well um so the next session will be on december the 8th um and it will be with uh, Professor Helen Phelan, who is the director of the Irish uh, World Music uh, and Dance Academy at Limerick University. Um, and she is actually, um, she is uh, the daughter of uh, uh, Irish emigrants to New York, but is now relocated back in, in Limerick. Um, and she's also a, a singer and she has written um, well, she works a lot with choirs and she's been working quite a lot with um, actually uh, ref refugee communities in Ireland and she has written compellingly about the idea of singing as a right, as in R-I-T-E, a right to belong. Um, so it's going to be a very interesting uh, talk and I think there will be a sort of practical um, I think she might try and get us to, to use our voices a bit um, during the session. So um, I'll just check the chat. I've got there's a one new message. Yes. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, I suppose I could uh, maybe I will share the map. I was going to share. Um, we have had somebody, uh, Patrick Dexter, who's a very brilliant cellist, has um, added something to the map uh, this last week. Um, and it is him playing. Uh, can I get to this? Here we are. Um, Amazing Grace on the cello. And um, so uh, the starting point of our project has been this hymn, this Welsh hymn, Pereir in Oiv, written in the 18th century. But actually, in the period that Catherine's been talking about today, sort of in the 60s and 70s, that 18th century hymn became associated with the tune Amazing Grace. So, um, yeah, I will play this uh, to, to, to play us out tonight um, because, uh, again, it's on the west coast of Ireland, which is where we will where we would be at the next session. But so here we, here we go. Thank you, Ron. Thank you to everybody. Nice. Gorgeous. <clears throat> Very lovely. 
so thank you very much everyone um i hope to see you all um or some of you and um again on the 8th of december um it's been another brilliant um incredibly rich uh session um lots of food for thought there um so yeah thank you very much catherine you, my catherine. pleasure lovely to meet you all you thank you take care all the best bye bye slam slam slam, slam. 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 slam.